As our subject of value is to be based largely upon a Zen concept, I think it might be appropriate and quite proper to use a Zen example. The greatest of all Zen artists was the Japanese painter Seshu. Seshu lived from 1420 to about 1506. There is some minor confusion as to the exact date of his death. The life and character of Seshu is rather unique, inasmuch as perhaps he is the only artist in Asia, and possibly the only artist in the world, about whose superiority there is no argument. Among the Japanese people, for example, it makes no difference, really, whether you are a connoisseur or uh, perhaps merely a shopkeeper or a grocer or a woodcutter. If you ask any of these people the name of their greatest artist, the answer will always be Seshu. This in itself is rather interesting, culturally speaking. Because it is not often that we find an artist, musician, or a literati in any level who is universally acceptable. Most uh, brilliant leaders are acceptable only to persons in their own level, in their own general area of thinking. But here we have an artist who not only is acceptable to all of the people of his country, but breaks another traditional precedent. He is acceptable to the Chinese. Now this is more of a condescension than you might at first imagine, because very largely the Chinese regard, regarded in the classical period at least, uh, almost all other nations as barbaric, and nearly all other individuals barbarians that they should recognize a Japanese artist is therefore one of the highest tributes that can be paid uh, to creative genius in Asia. There is a reason, of course, perhaps, why they have a certain sympathy for Seshu, because during his rather long and interesting career, he visited China and remained for a number of months studying Chinese art techniques. He therefore bridged the two schools in an astonishing way. But if he uh, belonged to both China and Japan, it was largely because Zen belonged to both China and Japan. And his attainments in these areas of artistic specialization won him recognition in both countries. Not long ago, I happened to be reading over an art criticism dealing with Japanese painters and uh, a very outstanding leader, an outstanding authority in Japanese art made his criticism of Seku, listing his abilities uh, in the following arrangement and also explaining why Seshu enjoyed so noble a reputation. And in the order of importance, this very learned specialist uh, gave the abilities of Seshu in this way. First and most important, Seshu was a Zen monk. This was his first claim to fame. And in this claim to fame, it was supported for the fact that while he was in China, visiting a monastery there, to study art, he was given a seat in the monastery next to the abbot. Now this is important. This makes for great art. So the first important thing about Seshu was that he was a monk and that while he was in China he was allowed to sit next to the abbot of an important then monastery. Obviously these are the basic qualifications of an artist under any conditions. The second reason why Seshu is considered great is because the most careful analysis of his life has indicated the continuing nobility of his character. By nobility of his character meant 
uh, the loftiness of his concepts of life, his uh, innate appreciation of value, uh, the way he deported himself in countless trivial incidents which have been most carefully cherished and remembered. He was of noble character. His third qualification as an artist was that he possessed extraordinary depth of understanding, which enabled him to attain to the tenth grade of a painter. Now, this understanding says nothing whatsoever about mixing ink or anything of that nature. His depth of understanding was his penetration into the mystery of Zen. And he demonstrated this penetration in his famous painting of Daruma, the great patriarch of Zen, in which it is said that he broke through the entire framework of Daruma's mortality and revealed him as a pure principle of power in space. This was very important. This indicated extraordinary artistic capacity. The fourth reason why he was a great artist was that he chose to live simply. That in all things he maintained a gentle but dignified austerity. In his consciousness there was no luxury. In his entire life he never sought the applause of anyone. He never compromised his work to please anyone. Uh, he never made any effort, whatever, uh, to dignify his achievements. He never placed any value upon a painting. And whenever a, paint, a person asked him the price of his work, he replied, it is nothing, and gave it to him. Now this is regarded as simplicity of life and justifies the concept of a great painter. Uh, the next and last note on the list of credentials is that he had good technique. Now this is an interesting point of view. In other words, he was an admirable artist, no one denied that. But that was not why he was great. That was not why he was revered in his own time and admired by those who came after him. His painting, of course, is consistent with this entire concept. He was essentially a Kumi artist. That is, he painted in black on white. Only in very slight and sometimes rather offhand manner are light color tones introduced into his work. Essentially, his work is Zen in the sense that it is bones. Bones drawn in black upon white. Bones in which the substance or essence of things is carefully picked out from all of its involvement. And one of his great scrolls, for which he is especially remembered, the scroll of the four seasons, unfolds slowly through the four great seasons of the year, identifying these seasons with the four degrees of human consciousness from infancy to maturity. And in these seasons we find nature magnificently depicted, not merely for the purpose of representing artistically some composition, but in an effort to cause nature to speak, uh, to reveal its own essential structure beneath the surfaces of prettiness or transcendent uh, uh, overtones, uh, Sechu strikes for the fact, for the fact which he regarded as the most beautiful part of the entire composition. So it is quite obvious why he had so well remembered and so deeply respected. It was because to the Eastern mind, the great artist must in some way be a great person. Here is, I think, one of the conflicts that we have uh, in our art standards in the West, uh, somewhat, I fear, to the detriment of our Western standards. Uh, this is not intended to imply that uh, an artist in the West must be another Seshu or cannot paint a decent picture without being a Zen monk. That isn't the point at all. But the point is that we have been rather, we'll say, thoughtless in failing to recognize the relationship between character and production. To the Oriental mind, there must be good in anyone who does good things. 
And the problem always is if possible to discover this and uh, to recognize uh, that we have a right, in fact a duty, uh, to make certain that these things with which we surround ourselves are productions of consciousness. Uh, that when we are influenced, that we are influenced by something innately superior. That the influence itself may have importance or value to us. And this brings us to the particular problem of the evening, namely the philosophy of value. Looking in our English dictionary, for example, we find what has happened to our concept of value. In all definitions of a general nature in the dictionary, value is associated with economic worth. Value is how much is it worth. Not in terms of its nobility, but in terms of its cash equation. If a thing is worth a dollar and we pay a dollar for it, then we have value. If it is worth 50 cents and we pay a dollar for it, then we have no value or less value. And if it's worth two dollars and we pay a dollar for it, then it's a bargain. That is the way in which we think. Now, in uh, great art, from the earliest time, real artists have warned us against this. They have warned us that value is something which cannot be measured in terms of price. This doesn't mean that good things must be free, but it does mean that value must be present in order to have anything worth what we pay for it. So we must try to escape from the concept of value being always associated with price or with worth in terms of economic displacement or equivalent. Thus we have this word which we want to try to make something out of, kihin, which means literally moral value. Now moral value substantially means that the value must be constructive. A thing cannot be judged by meaning alone, because meaning may be either good or bad. It must be judged by moral value. It must be judged in terms of what it contributes to a total good, in what way it advances some legitimate purpose. Things that mean nothing in terms of value have no value. And regardless of how expensive they may become in our way of life, they are still valueless in terms of their contribution to us. The objects are something with which there is a common responsibility in nature. Anything that does something for us, we owe something to. Now a beautiful picture that does something for us is a responsibility as well as an opportunity. Therefore, if we have gained from it, we must give certain consideration to this work of art. We must protect it. We must guard it as carefully as we can. We must cer make certain that when our stewardship over it ceases, that it will pass on to others whose tastes are similar to our own. And one of the things that uh, Zen teaches us at a very early degree is that nothing belongs to anyone. Even Daruma doubted if we belong to ourselves. Uh, there is a grave question as to whether there is any proprietorship in the universe. Things, however, come into the keeping of people. And these people become custodians. They become protectors, guardians of values. And wherever such guardianship is established, it is usually a voluntary one. We surround ourselves with things of beauty because we feel that we need them, because we choose to have them, and perhaps because we choose to expend upon them uh, certain monetary facts uh, which we might otherwise direct to less valuable ends. Thus we have chosen these things for ourselves. We have paid for them, perhaps sacrificed other things in order to have them. Thus they become our wards, 
we are given a certain period of stewardship. If a piece of art is truly great, it may very well be quite old. This means that it descends to us only because a group of preceding stewards have been faithful in their protection of the value of that particular thing. They have served it as lovingly as a Japanese uh, might guard and take care of his bonsai tree, which will descend to him perhaps through five or six generations of his family. A week's neglect and the tree would be gone, but it comes to him, not having been neglected even for a day by those of his ancestors who may have guarded it and loved it over a period of 200 years. Thus if a beautiful little object, a fine little bowl, a wonderful piece of carved jade, a magnificent example of crystal, comes to us, it comes to us because others have protected it, because for a long period of time it has been guarded against both natural and artificial hazards. Unfortunately, many great art treasures are gone and can never be revived or restored. But those that do come down, come down because of generations of faithful stewardship. Thus, when we receive this thing into our keeping, we already have a lesson in moral value, if we want to accept that lesson. We have the lesson of the time and the thought, the sincerity and the contrition, the patience, the gentleness, and perhaps even the courage which has been involved in protecting beauty for its own sake over a long period of time. While it is true that many art objects change hands and pass into the keeping of the merchant, most uh, great collectors have held those things which they held most dear until their own passing. Therefore, these have become parts of their estates. The individual who owned them never sold them, never received any economic return for them. They were value as living things to that person. If his descendants wish to scatter them to other people, that is their right. But the person who really loves does not buy for a profit. He buys to keep, to enjoy, to cherish. And unless it is an inferior object which he outgrows, he will generally take care of it till the time of his passing. Many wills have contained important and interesting clauses relating to these types of heritages or uh, gifts from the past. De Goncourt, one of the great French collectors, left a special uh, note in his will, stating that he did not wish these objects, which he had assembled with such love and patience, ever to pass into a museum or a gallery. He wanted his whole collection to be placed on the auction block and sold at one item at a time and one only, not as a group, but as single pieces. So the collectors all over the world who loved what he had loved might have an opportunity to acquire them. He did not wish them to be held, kept, or put away. He wanted others to immediately enjoy as soon as he could no longer enjoy. This type of thinking is a type of thinking that arises from the kind of value that is associated with art. And while it is true that many art collectors and dealers are simply uh, businessmen, these are not the real lovers of beauty. The real lover is the individual who carefully and lovingly guards what has brought joy and peace to his own nature. Now what is there in great art that is moral value? Why does it mean something in particular? That is a very hard question to answer because art has particular meaning for every person. Art is very often the handmaiden of some other interest. It represents perhaps a contact between the individual and some area of his personal interests or his personal uh, thoughtfulness. Perhaps, for example, an individual who is greatly interested in history may find certain episodes or epics in history which he wishes to come into more immediate and intimate contact with. By becoming a collector of the arts and artifacts of that period, he feels himself able to bridge an interval of time. He can actually hold in his hands these things that once belong to a culture group with which he is deeply concerned. Thus, uh, art very often follows historical and archaeological interests. 
this uh, very often in turn adds to the enrichment of the life of the person. Uh, completely on the reverse, very often art opens interests. An individual who collects, uh, for instance, Chinese art over a period of years is very likely to become China conscious. He becomes more acutely aware of the cultural institutions, the religions, the philosophies, and all the things that added to the enrichment of the Chinese cultural life. Therefore, a door opens for him. Perhaps his art forms a bridge to a larger world of interests that might otherwise be his. This is quite important to many individuals, especially those who have more or less heavy routine responsibilities and who are therefore greatly intrigued by the possibility of moving thoughtfully into larger spheres of mental and emotional maturity. So art becomes a factor in all of these types of problems. Art sometimes follows some special interest in the life of the person. And we know that there are many individuals who have formed massive and important collections, uh, largely because of the fact that each new edition uh, gave a, a new sense of maturity to an inward drive that this person had. This drive, perhaps, to know or to appreciate or to value. Most all great collectors at various times have expressed themselves as to what art did mean to them. And nearly all agreed that it was a great civilizing force. More than this, that it was a great training of the powers of observation and reflection. Uh, the art collector becomes peculiarly observant. And while this observant quality may be only symbolic when directed against an object of particular artistic uh, beauty, it becomes the basis of a larger attentiveness toward other things in life. Uh, the, the art lover finds beauty in itself, a power of bringing peoples together that through the sharing of beauty we seem to share in the souls of people. For beauty appears to be a form of soul expression. The creativity of the artist, what his ideal hope and patience meant, suddenly comes to us through his work. And we share in a certain degree in the maturity of his dream and in the self-sacrifice and patience by means of which a noble work was accomplished. Art also lifts the individual to a measure from the commonplace of values. Art carries the person from a world in, of barter and exchange into a world of delicate overtones, overtones which do help us to realize the essential power of soul consciousness in the life of man. We get very critical of human beings sometimes, and we become very critical of cultures and of races and of nations. But this tendency to be critical is softened and sometimes completely overcome by a contact with the arts of that people. We suddenly realize that a group cannot be completely bad, which can produce great good in art. That the love of beauty indicates a certain maturity and refinement where often we least expect to find it. We also sense the honesty, the integrity, the dynamic uh, endeavor of the folk artist and how primitive man, seeking to express his convictions and ideals, released his soul through art endeavor. Thus we become a little more democratic, a little more universal in our appreciations of things. Distant places seem to come nearer. Old things seem to take on a modern light. Modern things sort of mingle with the ages. And art stands forth as an eternal symbol of man's search for pure beauty. And he cannot make this search unless there is a great goodness in him, a great value in him. And this, more or less, we begin to sense as we sense and appreciate his insight his creativity, the marvelous designs and patterns which he is able to create. 
Art, therefore, gives us great psychological insight. It makes us more and more aware that there is something in life except high taxes and bobs. We also realize that in a wonderful way, even the failures of man uh, cannot deny the essential integrity that is locked in consciousness. And we find this integrity in all peoples and in all levels of consciousness in all times. And we gain a certain faith, a certain understanding and friendship that we might not ever otherwise ever be able to enjoy. The next point that perhaps is important to us in the problem of Zen is the disciplining of ourselves in the matter of what we might term moral value. In our modern way of life, the average person is unable to judge, for the most part, uh, what might be termed abstract value. Uh, we can judge uh, comparative costs and comparative prices, and we can be terribly influenced by so-called experts. Many persons today in our Western life who collect art are simply victims of dealers. They have no understanding, no actual comprehension of art themselves. They are told something is good, it is proven to them that it is good because it is expensive, and they thereby consider themselves collectors. Uh, in uh, the true world of art, this would not be considered anything short of uh, savagery. There is no such pattern in the essential values of things. Therefore, the Western person uh, seemingly has never become exceedingly skillful in the determination of art value. Of course, there have been exceptions, uh, but whereas most nations of the world have developed at least a deep appreciation for their own art, art appreciation is comparatively poor in the Western Hemisphere. Now, this in itself may not mean too much, but your Zen will warn you that where this appreciation is poor, other forms of appreciation are also poor, and that the individual who is unable uh, to use some discrimination in determining that which is right, fit, proper, or valuable will also have great trouble on the level of industry, economics, politics, family relationships, and every other decision area in his life. We must have some standard to determine the difference between good, better, and best. We must have some instinctive appreciation of value. Not having this appreciation of value injures us ethically. The way where we cannot appreciate value as beauty, we are likely to neglect value as honesty. Where we do not have any clear concept of that which is really best, uh, we are likely to be imposed upon, deceived, uh, and disappoint disappointed time after time in all of the simple problems of daily living. Thus, our art become involved in our lives, not perhaps because we will ever be collectors, but because as appreciators uh, we give moral force to the things which we accept. What we buy, the manufacturer will make. What we watch, we will get again on television. What we pay theater tickets to see will be the performances that will be given. If there is no discrimination, if there is no essential value, if there is no cultural censorship uh, by the person who is the potential customer, then we can expect very little growth or development in our arts, in our cultures, in our ethics, our morality, or any other form of essential moral good. If our religious life is not clear, if we do not sustain the religious principles which are obviously right, we cannot hope that these principles will ever become dominant in our culture. If our philosophical speculations are so amateurish that we are never able to rationalize any idea sufficiently, we will be imposed upon by innumerable false doctrines and our personal conduct will fall short of excellence. 
Thus, uh, the recognition of value becomes highly important to us. It becomes highly important to us even in terms of appearance, because the individual who does not know how to select his own clothing with a certain artistry is simply selling himself short as a personality. Wherever he does not have what we might term good taste, he is going to suffer from the consequences of poor taste. And these consequences are not merely personal. These consequences reach out into the larger areas of his living and have something to do with the structure of his economics and his industries. All these things are part of one grand pattern. And the answer to the pattern always, in good product, in good material, in good merchandise, is the intelligent customer. He is the one who must decide. There will be no shoddy goods unless he will buy it. There will be no imposture in business unless he will accept it. There will be very little corruption in politics unless he will tolerate it. So that in the last analysis, the value standard of the individual is his greatest protection in life. It not only supplies him uh, with an immediate clarity of insight, which can be economically most profitable in these days, but it also gives him moral force in the determining of the way of life which he is going to live. The voice of the people remains the voice of God, but when the people says nothing, then there is nothing to be said. Thus, our moral value problem is to determine these standards within ourselves. What constitutes the good, the beautiful, and the necessary in our own way of life. To come to some, some conclusions on this matter will enrich us in terms of culture and probably enrich us somewhat economically because we will save ourselves a vast amount of useless expenditure. It will also give us greater mental and emotional leisure because the wrong selection of value very often carries with it heavy penalties in wasted time, sorrow, grief, worry, fear, and doubt. So Zen goes after this key note of how shall we build a life of value. One of the uh, things that we have always had to uh, worry about and which, have, uh, which has been mentioned repeatedly in lines of great art is the importance of simplicity in beauty. The average person has not learned that man covers his mistakes with various elaborate devices, that it is nearly always true that your, un, uh, that your unworthy product will be more elaborate than your valuable product. It is uh, almost certain to be uh, definitely proven that where the individual has Seshu, as Seshu had, is in complete control of the dynamic principles of things, he does not have to fall into ostentation. Now we can take an example of value and the attitude of the world toward it in the problems of modern art. But uh, we are not going into a tirade on the moderns. I'm going to pause for a moment in the 18th and ninth, early 19th century for some of our horrible examples. Uh, this will protect us against being considered unkind to the contemporaries. Uh, today, uh, there is a grave amount of question in the West. Now we'll go back to Western man. Because in spite of all the mistakes we make, Western man does grow. His cultural insight is better than it was. The most difficult problem that we face is the intentional uh, misdirection of that insight. We are constantly misleading Western man in nearly everything of value. Occasionally, however, he wakes up and asserts himself. Now, we had an exceedingly bad period in art uh, during the late 18th and early 19th century that produced uh, some of the most spectacular but least desirable of so-called famous artists. And to give a good quotation, Gainsborough. Now, Gainsborough is probably admired a good deal by many people. Uh, but the works of the Gainsborough Romney 
uh, period are not good, regardless of how we may look at them. Uh, they are masterpieces of technical work, but Kihin is absent. They have no moral meaning. They are not important. Therefore, the history, and uh, you will see this uh, by studying recent texts on the subject, the history of the art of this period is economically most discouraging. Uh, many wealthy collectors, 50 or 100 years ago, paid fabulous sums for these paintings. Some of the Gainsborough and Romney paintings and Lawrence and some others brought as high as a half a million dollars. Today, those paintings could not be sold for ten cents on the dollar. We've caught up to them. We have suddenly realized uh, that they had one of the great deficiencies. They were utterly dated. They fitted into a time, a period, an architecture, and a type of home furnishing. They belonged to a certain psychology of life. That psychology of life became utterly decadent. Modern man no longer values it. Therefore, he no longer values these paintings. Uh, they are charming. There is no reason why anyone can en can't enjoy them who wants to, but they are not great art. And we have caught up with it. Therefore, we no longer value them. And it would be almost impossible to do very much with them. Uh, paintings by a very famous uh, woman painter, Rosa Bonheur, uh, which were fabulous at the time of her life, particularly her paintings of animals, most of them on huge canvases, uh, with a whole um, a group of horses, all life-size. These paintings brought two, three hundred thousand dollars when they were painted or shortly thereafter. Today you can buy them for ten or fifteen thousand dollars and still uh, be doing the dealer a service. Uh, these paintings are no longer respected. They are no longer great because they are dated. So we will find that a great part of post-Renaissance art in Western culture is dated. We no longer admire it. We no longer consider it great art. But go back to the primitives and you will find no bargains. You will find that the Western art of the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, the great art of the early Middle Ages, the great Gothic art, the work that was done by uh, the great artists of those times, particularly the ones that had, like Durer, a tremendous sense of Zen in those fingers which carved those wooden blocks, those pieces of art will never be cheaper because we have discovered in them a timelessness. They did not belong to a decadent cycle of production. So the primitive so-called in European art become more expensive every day and the moderns less so. There's a reason for this. There is a reason why the individual has gone back to what might be termed primitive line, gone back to power of design, gone back to impact and meaning, and perhaps most of all, significance. He has rediscovered moral value in these older works, value which he does not find, does not find the same psychic satisfaction in these products, which are obviously pretty, but are not beautiful. So this thing has been an experience to Western man also, and he is experiencing more and more of this in terms of his architecture, in terms uh, of music, in terms of literature. There is a great breaking up of patterns now and a consistent search for that which is essentially shibui, which has the astringency of greatness, which is not overly luxurious, which is not extravagant, uh, which is not uh, the evidence of some kind of status but is really a pure and clear statement of meaning, of, of dignified and powerful impact upon the beholder and the possessor. This would be in perfect harmony with the Zen thinking on this type of thing, and therefore gives us another lesson in what I would say is the essential of value, simplicity. 
greatness can afford to be simple. The great speeches that have changed the course of history have been short speeches, not long ones. Uh, the great orators whose words have come down to us with undying glory have used simple words. Perhaps the simplest words that we have, the most powerful words that we have in the Western world will be found in the Sermon on the Mount. The tremendous strength of these words. Words without embellishment, without any effort at great literary excellence. Ideas that are not drowned in words, but words which are used sparsely, uh, very humbly, very directly. Words used in this way for one reason only, namely that the person who used them knew what he intended to say and was therefore able to say these words simply, directly, and powerfully. The same type of expression when drowned in words comes to be almost meaningless. The dead silence that followed Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, a silence which he misunderstood to be derision, but which was really a silence that came from people who were no longer able to speak, but were tremendously overwhelmed by the simple words of this gaunt man who made no effort to make a great speech, and as a result made one of the greatest speeches of all time. This simplicity is key. This is the very thing uh, that, is co that comes as a natural gift to some people, but to others has to be acquired through a patient understanding of value. And this in our way of life today is especially meaningful to us because we are luxury ridden. And in the very mass of our luxuries, we have lost our value. We have even lost the power to enjoy. The more of these complications pile up, the less happy we are. And living as we live today, in probably the most exaggerated era of finance the world has ever known, with everyone living on a standard above anything previously possible to man, still a miserable generation of sick, unhappy people. This is because Zen is lacking. This is because the individual has not been able to cut through the superficial and to discover the essential nature of things that are real. To find reality, therefore, we must constantly seek for simplicity, realizing that complexity is a continual over and open opportunity for deceit. Wherever there is complexity, weakness can be hidden. Wherever long words are used, we are not sure of meaning. Maybe the person who used them wasn't sure either. Uh, many and many, a very bad conclusion has been dramatically concealed in classic Latin. Therefore, we cannot trust these things. But we can always trust uh, tremendous simplicity, the dynamic of the exact thing, that which is not too much and not too little. Not too much, lest it become a burden. Not too little, lest we be impoverished for lack of it. But always these things proper, correct, and enough. This type of thinking suggests certain disciplines which we can impose upon our own natures. Now, the problem of discipline has always been a little difficult to Western man because he always thinks of improvement in terms of labor. This is another Zen fallacy. Western man, for the last 2,000 years, has been nursing the idea that he had to suffer in order to be good. That his real distinction in life was gained by being miserable. If he could prove that he was worried to death or heartbroken, he was a citizen of distinction. This type of thinking is totally unrealistic. But as a result of it, we have made virtue seem to be so desperate and dismal a venture that the only possible relaxation is to cling to vice. This is wrong thinking. It is poor from a Zen standpoint. Now, we also uh, know that in our search for meaning, we are more skillful but unfortunate than we realize. Most people have an uncanny ability uh, to find some kind of a meaning in everything that happens. 
And in most cases, it's a bad meeting. As, as the result of that, we are devoted to the continuous search and quest for ulterior motive. If we can just knock down the virtues of other people, we feel that this is a way of attaining a democratic level, that anyone who appears to be superior must be discredited, and that actually behind every hero lurks some miserable vice-ridden form which we must discover. This in itself means that in our search for meaning we have become critics, uh, that we have instinctively developed the bad habit of doubting everything. Well, many people will say we come by this trait rather honestly. We have been deceived too frequently. We have been constantly exposed to so many disillusionments and disappointments that we have a right to suspect the worst. These disappointments and disillusionments, however, were not really the result of what other people did to us. They were the result of the fact that we did not understand moral value. We did not recognize the very clear symptoms and symbols which could have protected us. Because we had no standard, we were deceived, and then promptly turned upon the deceiver. And because we still have no standards, we continue to attempt to destandardize practically everything with which we come in contact. Today our natural tendency is to be suspicious of everything and everyone. What we need, therefore, is simply to redirect this energy. We have it. We do not live in a universe uh, without meaning, but we live in a universe of bad meaning. We live in a threatening universe. We live surrounded by threatening circumstances. Our observation nearly always reveals the weaknesses in things, or the perfidity in them. All we have to do then is to gain a different uh, level of insight. We are using this energy all the time, but it is not making us happy, it's not enlarging our lives or enriching us. It is simply making us more and more suspicious, more and more disillusioned, and more and more critical of the world in which we live. Zen, of course, goes after this situation with a very definite philosophy. And that is this philosophy of never, never expecting anything to be other than what it is, but expecting all things to clearly reveal their natures if we have the wit to understand. Therefore, we cannot deceive or be deceived if we ourselves have this power to measure value. The moment we apply it, uh, our troubles diminish. And instead of being lonely intellectuals, we become much more useful human beings. Another important thing that the West seems to have, have gotten a wrong notion about, which I think Zen can help with considerably, is that in our search for value, we nearly always think of value as something spiritual. If we are thinking of positive moral value, we, have begin, we immediately begin to think theologically. Uh, this Zen would not tolerate for a moment. Uh, the purpose is not to change life into a series of sermons. We are not supposed to simply go out and, and see in the universe nothing but a vast unfoldment of theological dogma. This is not the end which we are concerned with. We are, we are concerned rather with the fact of things. The fact of things really is the only spiritual reality there is, but this is a spiritual reality that is absolutely non-theological. Uh, the discovery of God in Zen, or the discovery of principle in Zen, is not regarded primarily as a religious experience. It is regarded merely as a normal use of function. That the individual should see good does not mean that he is necessarily superior. It merely means that he is normal. Thus, then, throws great emphasis upon normalcy as being greater than so-called superiority. Normalcy carries with it penetration. 
The normal person is not easily deceived. The normal person is able to take care of himself. The normal person is also capable of discovering many of the magnificent and beautiful truths of nature and of life without thinking of them especially as religious. Uh, to the Zen there is no such a thing as sacred and profane beauty. It is all one beauty. It is all one nobility. The individual is not more noble because he suffers, nor is he less noble because he is down on his knees playing with his children. These things do not mean what they have come to mean in the Western world. In the Western world, our dignities must be maintained, even if we fall on our faces trying to maintain them. In the Orient, dignity as we know it is nothing. Dignity is natural value. The individual who uh, has innate or internal dignity possesses an attribute uh, by means of which all life uh, takes a certain relation to him. It is not an assumed attitude. It is simply a, a, a natural power of value. It is uh, the ability uh, to perceive value and live according to it. This is the Confucian concept of the superior man, who is simply a person graciously endowed with humanities. He is not a person who is almost a god. Rather, he is a person who is almost human and in that has achieved about all that is necessary for man. Because as we have noted before, some human beings are able to be reasonably successful as human beings. Very few have ever been successful at being gods. Uh, we are just not constituted for it. There is too much clay in our lower members, and we might as well face this. So our real purpose is to achieve our humanity and to recognize that the human being in his natural shape and natural structure is just about what we have generally regarded a divine being to be. And that in our own natural humanity as it unfolds, we have everything that is necessary for value, for the appreciation of value and for the achievement of the state of value in ourselves. Thus value questing has nothing to do with discomforting or eccentric or unusual practices. Uh, the uh, value seeker is not different in the sense of being strange. He is merely different in terms of value because he possesses a little more consciousness of value. This does not, however, make him objectionable, nor does it make him a critic of other men. It is simply that the value in himself slowly enriches and matures his own personal existence so that he is able to have a fuller, richer, and happier life. Value does not imply inhibition because actually the person of good taste is unhappy doing that which does not reveal good taste. It is not a problem in which he tries to be good with a desperate desire to be bad. As his consciousness unfolds, he finds his greatest pleasure, his greatest fulfillment in the enrichment, the enrichment of his own value consciousness. So we'll take two or three simple little problems in which perhaps the matter of value uh, can be better understood. Let us assume, for example, that a person during his mortal years here, whatever they may be, has accumulated a number of things. Now these accumulations become the basis of a new concept of life. Uh, every once in a while people get desperate, gather all their possessions and send them to the goodwill industries. Uh, at the present time, however, there's a peculiar situation arisen. The goodwill industry seem to be a little more critical, shall we say, than the accumulator, and half the time won't take what we want to throw away. This is a, a, a sidelight on something. But supposing we have gradually assembled a mass of heterogeneous belongings. Now here's where we can settle down to the problem of value. One individual finally got rid of a certain photograph 
because it was taken long ago and every time they looked at it they felt older. Now this of course uh, is probably time for that picture to go. But it didn't have to go for that reason. What was its moral value? Could it have meant something had it been approached differently? Could it help have helped this individual to bridge a, an interval in his own consciousness? Could he have considered this picture representing his own youthfulness and in so doing also considered how much he had grown since then, how much more mature he was in understanding. If this picture therefore conveyed uh, the, the image of a self outgrown, it could still be a very interesting problem in moral value. It could give him something. But if he has simply grown older without growing any better, then this picture becomes a kind of a perpetual reminder of a wasted lifetime. And the quicker it is gone, the better. But this is because of the person, not because of the object. Now we also realize that uh, in these kind of things, there is another sort of discrimination possible. But this comes a little further along, and we can't expect everyone to immediately make use of it. But the, uh, one of the oriental concepts in these matters is that we shouldn't keep anything ourselves that won't be valuable to someone else after we're gone. That'll thin us down and do it quickly. <laughs> this will get rid of innumerable things which have been fire hazards for years. In other words, supposing this particular collection was passed on to a perfect stranger, what would it be worth? Yet if it has value, it will always have value. Well, we'll say, after all, we can't expect a uh, perfect stranger to remember our Aunt Hattie the way we do. And that picture is a very good likeness of her, and she has many associations that are of interest to us. That's all right. If that is a means of bringing some positive reaction to ourselves, then in that picture there is key, moral value. If we remember her in a way that would cause us to be a better person, then there is value there. But that value is probably for ourselves alone, unless in that face there is a value even for a perfect stranger, and it can happen. There are things which uh, are very personal, and yet in a strange way can make the whole world better. And there are other things that are very personal that are not even making us any better. But uh, as we go further along in the, in the realm of artistry, uh, we have an in, in inclination to recognize the universality of value. That which will really help us, usually will really help other people. And these things which are merely very personal memories, often mingled with regrets, sometimes, although there is a certain nostalgia in them, they're not doing us any real good. There are things which are binding us to old patterns, refusing to let us outgrow certain reminiscences and certain associations. And we might be better to do what the American Indian did every so often, tear up everything and start over. Because these things do not always serve us as catalyzing agencies for good. Very often they tie us to something. I remember one individual who was miserable all their lives because in middle life they lost most of their worldly goods and had very little to show for it except a photograph of the ancestral home. Every time they looked at the picture they burst into tears. They were never able to get over the fact that they had once lived there. This picture should be immediately relegated to the historical society or something of that nature which appreciates fine old colonial homes because it's doing that person no good. So if you have things around you the associations of which are not making you stronger, then these things have no great value. They have no kihin. They do not make you face life with greater courage. Now you may have so many things mixed around in a situation of this nature that instead of working for you or against you, they simply confuse you. You are surrounded by meaningless things. Things that perhaps might have meaning to someone else, might have had meaning to you at one time, but things which have ceased to have meaning. Now you can sit down very quietly with these things and say to yourself, have I exhausted their meaning? Have I overlooked a great deal? Is there meaning here that I don't remember, or haven't thought about, haven't recognized? 
Is there some reason why I did keep these things, even though they have gradually become comparatively uh, unconsidered? If you can't rescue meaning from these things, then they are cluttering life. Then they are confusing. They are carrying into the psychological nature of the person a certain untidiness. And one of the great secrets of moral value is this tidiness of things. Either what you have should serve you, serve someone else, or be respectfully and reluctantly, uh, as the Japanese do, buried with military honors. Uh, uh, in Japan, for instance, uh, when a well-known and well-loved and well-used article is either no longer good because it is worn out, or no longer valuable because of its associations, no one would think of destroying it in the common sense of dumping it into the nearest garbage pecan. Uh, what would be done with it would be to take it quietly to a beautiful place in the forest, dig it a little grave, bury it, and say a prayer over it. Because after all, at one time or other, it was a faithful friend, a useful help in some emergency. It was meaningful to someone. And in, in those countries in old days, they never even threw away a newspaper because a newspaper had at least given them a message that might be important to them and was entitled to dignified burial. Well, there's a, we may laugh at the idea of the dignified burial, but consider the number of corpses that we leave above ground as far as these things are concerned. At least these people had the good taste to bury their dead. We try to live with it, and we find it very uh, demoralizing. So we begin to gradually sort things toward simplicity. Now as we gradually get rid of things that are not particularly valuable, we begin to reduce ostentation or to reduce confusion. And gradually as the things that are not very meaningful begin to disappear, what's left becomes more and more significant, sometimes more and more of a problem because it's quite possible that when we are living in confusion we don't notice how bad a chair looks but when it stands all by itself we can say how have I lived with it this long if we have uh, the curtains in the room all pinned up with pictures of our relatives we don't notice that the curtains themselves are in rather bad taste we take off the pictures we wonder how we can continue to live with the curtains this is an experience that we have so little by little, that which is not good for us becomes apparently not good for us. We sense it, we know it, whereas previously, by confusion, we were able to ignore the entire issue. But we can never ignore the psychological effect of these things upon ourselves, nor can we ever ignore the psychological effect of uh, confusion upon the integration of our own personality. So little by little, we reduce these things until we come to a more or less stark simplicity. When we begin to do this, something else begins to happen. After we remove all of these knickknacks and this cluttering, and this can be an internal process in our own minds just as easily as it can be a process in a house or an apartment, as we begin to get rid of the brick a brackery so to say, uh, we begin to find that simplicity may be hard to live with. One of the reasons why simplicity is hard to live with is because it demands more from us. The simple life must be a more valuable life, or it is simply a bare life. Here we come uh, face to face with a reality. If the room is empty, because we have thrown away all the junk, then we are forced to live in an empty room. Now, there's nothing more tragic than an empty person in an empty room. This is compound emptiness, and it's most trying. Under those conditions, our first thought probably would be to go to the nearest auction and fill up again, because the, the very presence of this emptiness is a burden on our spirit. We can't associate emptiness with cleanliness. That is, cleanliness not of, of dirt, but cleanliness of accumulation. But after we begin, begin to simplify the, the situation, 
things begin to happen to us. One of the things that happens to us is that we begin to feel certain needs for things that are essential or valuable. We've gotten rid of those grand old chromo portrait, uh, portraits and uh, lithographic, uh, uh, we'll say, landscapes that once uh, ornamented our walls. They were pretty bad to start with. Uh, we didn't mind them as long as they were mixed in with a thousand other things. But when they were all by themselves, we couldn't stand them any longer. So we got rid of them. Now we have empty walls. Well, most people are not quite ready for the entirely empty wall yet. That is, uh, that is a, an asceticism that gradually changes a home into a monastery. And that is not the idea. But now we begin to think in terms of what would we want to put on that wall. What now would make this uh, place, this house we live in, warmer and better and closer to an expression of ourselves? In olden times, it was very hard for Western man to get self-expression because he inherited too much. He got all the family heirlooms, and he was a traitor if he destroyed one of them. He kept them carefully to pass on to his descendants, and by the third generation, someone had the courage to throw them out, but not him. Today, we don't do this so much anymore. Uh, vast accumulations are not very practical. We live less and less permanently and in smaller space. Therefore, we do not have such a tendency to preserve old things. But we do very often have those things which are too good to throw away, etc., 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 but the time may come when we have to dispose of them. Perhaps someone else needs them. We do not. But we are now with a very simple, almost austere situation and a song in our heart that needs uh, some kind of brightness and music for its own continuance. Now we begin to choose. Now out of greater discrimination we decide what we really want there. And if we are wise people, it may take us six months or a year to decide what we're going to put on that wall. But when it is on that wall, it is going to have kihim in our lives. It is going to have moral value. We now want it because we need something in particular. We've gotten rid of the things we tolerated or the things that we lived with so indifferently we forgot we even owned them. Now the thing has meaning. Taste begins to move in ourselves. Consciousness begins to determine what we are going to have. And little by little, we make these changes until we finally have a few better things to live with. These better things do something for us. They help us in the process of expressing our own consciousness. Their simplicity becomes orderliness in our psychic integration. We are better people because we have learned uh, to understand this betterness. Well, when the time comes, however, to suddenly start this betterness problem, we are likely to feel a little bit lost. Many, many people suddenly discover that they have no idea what kind of a picture they ought to hang on a wall. They have the slightest concept of a good color for the room in which they're going to live. They don't know what would be a really suitable and attractive carpet. They don't know. So they try to get some help on this subject, uh, some advice. And there's always someone to advise them. And they will advise them what kind of carpet to put down just as quickly as they'll advise them what candidate to vote for. And the individual will be moved by the same series of weaknesses in himself. He doesn't understand. He doesn't mean not to understand. But he simply has grown up, become an educated person, perhaps a parent, success in business, a respected citizen, has the slightest idea what color carpet he likes best. He just doesn't know. So he goes down where there are 500 samples and he's worse off than he was before. He just doesn't know. The only answer in Zen for this situation is to sit on the bare floor until you find out yourself. Decide what you want. If you find something and you think you like it and you put it down and you immediately hate it, that is Zen. Get rid of it and start over. Educate yourself. 
Because what you are doing when you say you're educating yourself is really you are expressing something of your own inner life. Now it is naturally desirable and helpful for the person who is going to do something about the Zen attitude to have some little understanding of the subject. Uh, he can't always immediately step from a chaos of confused values to an admirable power to select correct values. But fortunately for him, there are many ways in which he can learn. He can learn through good books. He can learn by going to the public library and studying not how to decorate his home, but perhaps studying Zen art. Uh, studying what constitutes fineness. What is it that made Seshu great? You can get reproductions of Seshu's pictures and find out what made Seshu great. It may be a long time before any of us will understand the full depth of this man, but we can begin to sense meaning. We can sense value. And we can gradually educate ourselves just as we would educate ourselves in bookkeeping or accounting or anything else. But most people do not sort of feel that this kind of education is necessary. But this is the most important kind of education, because it is that form which gives us peace of soul. It is this which gives us health, moral, emotional, mental health. It gives us significance in life. It lifts us into the understanding of things which are right. And this understanding is a terribly important thing to have. And in the rush and haste and jumble of our present way of life, we don't think about these things. And as a result, we're sick all the time. And life goes badly for us, and our homes break up, and our children are disobedient. These things happen because of something. They're not merely accidents happening to the best of people in spite of themselves. They are happening to people who in some way have not been able to integrate their values sufficiently. That haven't been able to solve this uh, very uh, uh, important and subtle situation. So, little by little, by uh, taking a profound interest in something, the individual gradually discovers what is good. Now, the final proof of what is good within a range of what can be good is the simple expression of consciousness this I like. This, I, I, this, is, this is for me. I don't know why, but this is for me. This means something. This gives something to my consciousness. And the simplest childlike acceptance of this is a simple statement, I like it. And if this is uninfluenced by other people, if this is uninfluenced by price, if this is uninfluenced by fashion or the modes of the day, but arises from the deepest part of our own understanding. When we say, I like it, that means that it is right for us at that particular time. Now, perhaps five, ten, twenty years from now, we may not like it so well. We shouldn't. Unless we have been far wiser than we realized, we should outgrow that which we like, but not immediately. And as we outgrow it, we will instinctively replace it if we do not allow some false values to cause us to hold on to it. Thus, the final power of Zen is the simple, direct statement of this I like. This, it gives expression to consciousness. If we catch ourselves liking the wrong kind of things long enough, we will begin to doubt our own taste, and then we'll do something about it. But... The simple term of why do I like it, if you can break it down, if you can rationalize it at all, it is that it should do something good to you. It should do something to make life a little more valuable. It should open a door. Every picture on a wall should be a window into something into some form of understanding. This doesn't mean they should all be pastoral scenes by any means. But they should be things which open doors of appreciation that transform limitation into openness, uh, the airiness of freedom, 
Everything that we have should free us, never, never enslave us. The only enslavement is our responsibility to guard and protect that which is good. Otherwise, these things are all open doors to experiences of consciousness. You will find this type of uh, philosophy uh, keeps things rather simple. It saves us a lot of money in the long run because it prevents us from accumulating things which we will never really want. It gets us out of the trinket buying class and gets us away from the toy accumulating instinct of some children. It begins to be something valuable and something important. Now usefulness is a value. Usefulness is a moral value. Therefore there are many things that we have to own or possess that we need because we use them. Zen would never for a moment rec recommend that the individual not make proper use of those things which are necessary for him. And in our way of life, necessities reach out into fields of luxuries that our forefathers never knew. This means, perhaps, that we now include certain luxuries among necessities. If this is true, there is no effort to take them away from us. The problem, however, always is to try to reduce these things uh, to their minimum. Uh, always recognizing that we become servants of anything we possess that we do not use. That we become servants of things which require more care to maintain than this good which they provide. And because we are status-seeking people, uh, and because our image is influenced by our possessions, many individuals become hopelessly overburdened in an effort to appear to be prosperous. This is not the answer to any essential value whatever. Uh, in the problems of things necessary, there is also moral value. Because these things necessary teach us. Every device and contrivance that we have is based upon a principle of some kind. This principle can be important. It can be instructive. It can be valuable. Also, all conveniences that we have are time or labor savers, at least theoretically. Consequently, they are protecting our time allotments. They are protecting our energy reserves. Therefore, in turn, they provide us with greater opportunity. Conveniences are only uh, instruments of liberation. They are only valuable because they enable us to have more time for important activity. The individual who fills their home with every labor-saving device that they have develops by this means a considerable amount of leisure and spends his entire leisure watching television is really caught in a vicious situation. He has bought the leisure, he has paid for it. He has surrounded himself with means of labor-saving, but he has no uh, understanding, no spirit of kihin to help him to do something with the time and energy he has saved. So Zen comes in with uh, uh, a very important thought, namely that the automatic dishwasher is of really no value unless it frees the person to do something more important than wash dishes. Now that it is not the purpose of the dishwasher merely to save labor. Its purpose is to free human consciousness to grow. And if the consciousness doesn't grow, the whole project is a dismal failure. I remember some years ago, I, a well-known family had a Japanese houseboy. This young man was a master flower ranger, and he was also a master of a number of related oriental arts. One day the family came home and found all of the important and expensive gadgets out on the back, in the backyard, stacked around the trash can. It was a very bad moment for the family. And they immediately got all ready to throw the Japanese houseboy out on his ear. He blandly was asked, when he, they asked him why he had thrown all their best dishes washers and all their coffee makers and toasters 
and washing machines and everything and pile them up for the garbage man to take away, he very blandly replied, he might as well because they didn't mean anything anyway. The people had had all these things for years and still wasted all their time. So they might just as well throw them out and work because they weren't good for anything else. Obviously, the young Japanese houseboy found new employment soon <laughs> after, but he made a point which these people simply were not big enough to see. He was trying in a fine, gentle, zen manner uh, to uh, relieve them of certain mistakes and express the facts of life. But this is a situation that nearly all Western man faces. The tremendous increase of conveniences and commodities and the attendant rise in delinquency from the inability to use time. There is absolutely no reason why we should have all these devices if the free time is going to be spent in worry, and lots of it is. Or if as a result of all these devices we have two hours with which to gather with our neighbors and analyze how long it will be before the first bomb falls. This yeah, there's no use in having devices under such conditions. Devices, all forms of so-called conveniences, are created to help man to have more opportunity to be human. To get away from certain drudgeries which afflicted him in the past, but which, by the way, usually kept him healthy, and into a state of consciousness in which he could grow more rapidly. So our Zen concept comes in here and says that probably the heaviest responsibility we assume is that which comes as a result of buying this time and then wasting it. Kihin also tells us something about the moral value of time. It tells us how, in one way or another, we should use this important commodity. Uh, time actually uh, even in the Zen philosophy, should be enjoyable. There's nothing in Zen that tells us that we have to spend all our spare time sitting in meditation with our eyes crossed, gazing at the point of our noses. This is not the Zen way of life. Certainly they enjoy meditation and the contemplative existence, but this is because they enjoy it and not because it is a terrible hardship uh, wished upon them. The purpose of, the, of uh, time in Zen is to have a certain enthusiasm about it. There's a very interesting picture among the drawings of uh, the uh, Japanese artist Hokusai, a series of drawings called Views of Mount Fuji. And it's a whole album of nothing but pictures of this mountain from every conceivable angle and with every conceivable property added to make it a more interesting and dynamic scene. In one of these scenes, uh, Hokusai himself apparently has opened the shutters of a circular window in his studio, is looking out and is seeing Fuji in the group of clouds out against the horizon. The old man is sitting in, with his arms over his head. He is just in a state of ecstasy. He is practically reaching out, grabbing for the mountain. He has never been so happy in his life. At that moment, the light was just right, and he had this magnificent view of the mountain, and he was perfectly entranced. He was almost in an ecstasy of pleasure over this wonderful thing he was looking at. He was enjoying himself. He was not under some terrible compulsion in which he had to be good or had to see something out there. He loved it. It was his mountain. It was the thing that meant a great deal to him. The arrangement of light and cloud had made it particularly beautiful at that moment, and he was supremely happy. And Zen has this purpose of giving us a certain amount of happiness to make us enjoy life perhaps more than we've ever enjoyed it before because we do not destroy happiness by our own attitudes. Thus, in uh, using time in the Zen concept, we use it to enjoy that which is good. We, uh, we find the tremendous joy of things that are not even costly. We find the tremendous appreciation of the beauty in things because of the increasing availability of beauty in ourselves. The Zen lives in a rather pleasant world, a world in which 
We are more cheerful, more contented, more optimistic than we could possibly be under the pressures with which we generally burden ourselves. One of these pressures is debt. It is very hard for modern man in the West to laugh today without a snicker. He, has, he can't have a real good old-fashioned laugh. He has to have a kind of a sour, sarcastic smirk because we can no longer afford to laugh. Life has burdened us so that real, honest humor has lost its appeal, lost its meaning to us. We can't enjoy. We can only think of the terrible expense, morning, noon, and night. So Zen, by simplifying life, gives us back our sense of humor. It makes simple things enjoyable, valuable, and useful, and frees us from all of this artificiality, artificiality with which we are constantly burdening our own lives. So Hikihin, as moral value again, gives us the ability uh, to enjoy the allotments of beauty uh, which belong not only to our own means but to our universe. Uh, the same problem arises, for instance, a friend of mine not long ago was uh, in Japan and came back and said that everything was lovely except he wished they'd paint the houses. Uh, though he said there's nothing but a bunch of old bleached wood houses everywhere you turn. They look as though they needed three coats of paint and a good primer. Uh, but they wouldn't have it for anything in the world. When we build a house, we want it to dominate the landscape because we think a house is about the most beautiful, important thing in the world, especially if it's ours. And the more money we can put into the house and the taller it stands, the more it overshadows the neighbors, the happier we are. We want everyone to see the house. But where Zen dominates, you don't have this problem. Therefore, you also escape from the whole problem of keeping up with the Joneses, which has been worrying us to death for the last hundred years. Actually, uh, the uh, Zen... Uh, uh, believer, not necessarily a monastic person, just one in whose heart the Zen doctrine is affecting his way of life to some degree, his first thought is, let's not mutilate the scenery. After all, I can't build anything that is beautiful as the tree I'm going to have to cut down to put the house there. Or if I've got a nice little glade here with some beautiful trees and some rocks in the background and a nice mountain coming up in the rear, and here is a, a lovely stretch of lawn and a little pool and uh, some rocks and some iris, well, what do I want to put a house there for? All I'm going to do is mutilate this thing. Oh, it's going to be much less beautiful than it would be if I didn't put a house there, but unfortunately I have to live. Therefore, I'm going to put the house there, but it's going to be as unnoticeable as possible. It's going to retire. It's going to be hide me in those trees and not dominate them. The trees are still going to dominate. And perhaps a nice rustic little house with those trees isn't going to look so badly. It won't make the trees uh, particularly uh, unpleasant to look at. But no one would imagine that against this beautiful foliage, against this wonderful background perhaps of ancient cryptomeria or something of that nature, someone is going to put a turquoise blue house with a fine white edging. Uh, this just doesn't imagine, doesn't, isn't imaginable to these people. The beautiful thing is to live as close to that which is the source of beauty, which is life itself. That actually... In Zen, the universe itself is so magnificent that the duty of man is, is to become a kind of gardener, uh, to take care of it, uh, to make certain that it retains its charm, to prevent perhaps a certain wildness from overwhelming things, just to control but never to destroy, uh, just to direct, never to frustrate. So as a result, my friend thought that all the houses needed a coat of paint, simply because it didn't occur to him that these people didn't want a coat of paint. And in speaking of that type of thing, their own little way of building is peculiarly appropriate to their country, perhaps wouldn't work here at all. 
uh, perhaps we are going to be uh, the proud possessors of the mansions for a long time and they're going to disturb the scenery and they're going to be next to each other and no two are going to match architecturally and we're going to live in a mild headache as a result. That may be the way we have to do it. But it's nothing to be particularly proud of or glad about. It simply shows some way the lack of this maturity. Uh, maturity that means a great deal when we have to face a mature way of life. Uh, we are gradually growing up as a people. And barring acts of providence, we will continue to grow up until we ultimately mature. And as we grow older, we are going to face the problems of maturity. And as we face these problems, we're going to realize that we can only face them if we are mature ourselves. The day of the perpetual adolescent is disappearing. The responsibilities of existence are growing heavier every day. The average individual is not making the necessary adjustments to accept a new way of life that is coming upon us and is inevitably here to stay. In order to meet this new way of life without shock, without stress, without pain, without tragedy, we must move ourselves. We must adjust to something more mature. Well, what is there more mature than man that he can adjust to? The uh, Zen monk says there's one thing always more mature than man that he must adjust to, and that is his universe. Actually, survival is adjustment. It is acceptance. It is the individual fitting his own personal ambitions and purposes into a universal pattern that is mature and is continuing. Human styles come and go. Human periods of history will come and go. But nature goes on. The universe goes on. And man has his greatest probability of survival by adjusting himself to these large universal patterns. These universal patterns are not broken by tiny fragments of ambition as human patterns are. They're not measured from one war to another. Uh, nature's motions are measured by the seasons, by the centuries and by the ages. And nature keeps on going in a strangely wonderful and faithful way. And everywhere in nature, the truths of nature are apparent. And uh, man must live a little more in the consciousness of nature. And here in the West, we are losing that contact as day by day we fill up the earth with more and more of our own human uh, activities. Now, there is talk about continuing increase in population, population explosions, and the fact that perhaps less and less of this earth's surface is going to be available for natural contemplation. But as yet there is room. And if man grows adequately, he will gradually grow until nature and his own nature become so completely identified that he will then have the roots of endurance in himself, but he doesn't have them there yet. He still has to depend upon something greater, uh, something that has a, a more real or more uh, substantial finality about it. Uh, than what we know in our daily experiences. So in our way of life, it becomes very important uh, that we get a naturalness as against the artificialities which we know. Now, what are the natural things that Zen recognizes in the human being? Uh, Zen recognizes the essential dignities and values of those phases of human nature which are natural. Therefore, that man truly maturing matures in natural things. And what we call sophistication has practically nothing to do with maturity at all. Our idea of maturity, which is a, a gradual overwhelming of nature, has no place in Zen philosophy. What are the simple things that human beings uh, really uh, most enjoy and by which they are most secure in their life? One thing is, of course, that every human being needs to work. Zen is very particular about the fact that every human being must be occupied. They must be constructively occupied in some way. What we call a leisure class is a class that is wealthy enough to afford misery. Any individual who 
thinks in terms of leisure, thinks in terms of pain, whether he knows it or not. Leisure actually to the Oriental, Chinese, even the Hindu more or less feels the same way about this. Leisure is nothing more or less than time which is set aside uh, to purposes that are peculiarly, peculiarly and uniquely our own. Leisure is therefore an opportunity for a special kind of work, but never an opportunity to do nothing. So man naturally wants to work. He must work in order to be healthy. He must work in order to be tired, to digest his food, to do the various simple things which maintain mental, emotional, and physical equilibrium. The person, therefore, who is able to afford not to work must also be able to afford the doctor's bill, because he will have it, inevitably. Work is, therefore, a sign of dignity. Leisure is not. Today, we think of the person of leisure as the fortunate one and that this is a status symbol of the greatest importance. The man who doesn't have to go to his office and can spend his day at the golf club is thereby a privileged person. Actually, this whole concept is wrong. Actually, the individual who has not experienced the privilege of labor has something to learn about the essential mystery of life. The second thing that all human beings need, a more, a second perhaps only to their work, is a certain basic companionship. We need friends. We need people with whom we can share, through whom we can express, to whom we can communicate. We need to have a few persons at least with whom we can indulge in a mature enjoyment of life. Therefore, true, honest, sincere friends are essential to the civilized state of man. These uh, are not the type of friends who impose, who come to share their miseries. Uh, the true friend is the individual with whom there is communication. And... Uh, this communication is only possible where there are mutual interests. So after perhaps labor is communication, is sharing. We also need to give. It is tremendously important for the individual to have some responsibility or activity which claims a large part of his own life. We find our lives by giving our lives to, the, to things that we regard as more important than ourselves. Therefore, a person without a mission of some nature, without a sense of value, a sense that something or someone is better because they live, a person lacking this lacks most of the value of, of an important life. Then a life must have beauty. A life must have its participation in the dignities of value. A life must have appreciation of that which is important and true and valuable. A life must have the sense of fulfillment. And a complete and well-balanced life must be a life in which that which nature has indicated as reasonable and proper for man has been fulfilled, never evaded. Consequently, any effort to escape normal and reasonable responsibility impoverishes life. If the person lives a normal life according to nature and according to uh, the artistry of his own consciousness, he then has written his poem, for his poem is his life. He has composed great music, for this music is his own character. And he is an artist because he has artistically used the elements of his own opportunities to build together a magnificent painting of his career, of his value, of his meaning to other people. Zen on this basis simplifies things but takes away nothing that is essentially good. It tries to help people uh, to strip away the things that do not mean anything. And as a result of that, to have liberated time. I know that our way of life is rather more complicated than theirs, 
and that even if we have time, we do not always know what to do with it. Uh, it doesn't seem that we can go out and do these simple natural things that might make time uh, otherwise a very pleasant and wonderful opportunity. But you cannot stop a man from growing if he is determined to grow. You cannot put so many obstacles in his way that he cannot improve himself if this is his determination. Therefore, if growth doesn't mean that we can do some of these things as directly and literally as might have been possible in the bamboo grove, it is still essential that we do develop a sense of internal moral artistry. And uh, wherever we simplify life, we bring in value. We bring in improvement of self. We increase knowledge. We increase education. We share. We have more time for our children. We do things together more. We have also greater time for quiet meditation on these things which are meaningful and important to us. So by the gradual simplification of things, by the rejection of that which is meaningless, by the gradual conservation of energy, we may get even to the condition of the Taoist monk who has found that by utter conservation of resource he has almost lost the power to die because actually a large part of death is tension. There is no reason why the person of today cannot have a longer life than he normally expects to. Obviously it cannot always be done immediately and there is no individual who can be certain in our way of life uh, of the extent of years that may be ahead of him. But it is true that all other things being equal, the person who is integrated has the greatest probability of escaping those life-shortening factors which burden so many people. There may be things he cannot escape. Uh, it is not necessarily the final proof of virtue that we live to be 120 years old. After all, we're not living in the quiet, helpful atmosphere of the Diamond Mountains of Korea, uh, where, with the exception of a little political smoke that goes way over the top and is seldom known by any of the natives, the country is still a country of magnificent natural resources. There is no smog as we know it. There is no adulterated foods. There are none of the things that may have a tendency to shorten life. But all other things being equal with the adulteration and the smog, the facts are that as we simplify life, we save energy. We therefore have a little more energy with which to fight the smog. And other things also being equal, we may add another year or two to what might otherwise be a rather short existence. So uh, Zen tells us that by uh, the Zen technique, for example, that we reduce the probabilities of sickness. By the Zen simplification of consciousness, we reduce the probabilities of senility, which are always possibilities that loom a little bit uh, difficult on the horizons of the aged. The individual's faculties are not as likely to gradually fail uh, if this life has been uh, more quietly integrated. The, if certain impairments or limitations do arise, they are carried with greater dignity. The individual finds that the things that break other people's hearts do not break his because he has a different level of values. You take from a person of strong material attachments the few things to which he is attached, you take these from him, he is miserable. But if the individual is attached only to universal values, it's hard to take them from him. If he is attached only to principles which are eternal, it is hard for these ever to disappoint him or disillusion him. Therefore, he is free from a great many of these tensions and stresses and enjoys instead a greater sense of internal well-being. Out of all of these considerations together comes a certain artistry. And this is the kind of artistry that I think was recognized by the critic in the study of Seshu. Uh, the great artist is the person who has the artistic skill to create a great life. And a great life is a simple life lived with depths. And uh, almost inevitably, the simple life produces a certain amount of actual artistry. The moment we begin to overcome the confusion in our own natures, we do discover that we are artistic people and capable of creative artistry. 
Now, in Japan, with a population of some 90 million people, Zen has taken over a very large part of the conscious life of these people, and also it has done a great deal of the same in China and Korea. And the result is that an amazing percentage of the people will be found to be innately artistic. Uh, you will find that uh, the most common shopkeeper can arrange his goods in a ma most masterfully aesthetic manner. And uh, when you visit a small Japanese community and get away from the hustle and bustle of some place like Tokyo, which has outgrown all reasonable proportions, but get back among the people, you will find that it is very hard to get a dinner served to you without artistry. That a plate is artistic. That they can't put salad on it without making an artistic design out of the salad. They just can't help it. And the farmer has built an artistic house without an architect. And the best architects we have go over there and copy it. And he built it one night or started it one day without a ground plan. He just sort of let it accumulate. And when it got through accumulating, it was a masterpiece, and we go over and copy it. Simply because these people living with a certain attitude toward life, almost everything they touch reflects that attitude. I've seen the simple utensils in a Japanese kitchen that were carved by the man of the house out of nearby wood, the most simple things imaginable, and they're beautiful. We find the same artistry among many primitive peoples. We find the same artistry in Africa and in many remote parts of Asia and Polynesia, where the simple life produces a great artistic skill. Zen has done this, perhaps with a little more maturity than these other people have experienced, but the same general principle. It is hard not to dress tastefully. It is hard not to look well if you have a certain sense of beauty in yourself. And this sense of beauty comes from a gradually enriching appreciation of value, in which little by little you become so thoughtful of the things you do that every action is practically a work of art. Uh, the artistry arising from this is extremely naive. These people are not even aware of it. It is simply Zen working in them. Zen giving them a certain simple directness of action which has all the charm of nature's own way of doing things. And because we naturally like things to be attractive and charming and beautiful, of our own accord we would make them that way. And by means of simplifying life we have greater opportunity to act according to our own accord. When we are under tremendous stress and strain, we cannot be ourselves. Simplify life and more of ourselves will show through. And this showing through of self will almost certainly be an improvement. It will be a greater sense of value. We will have more charm, more appeal to other people. We will have greater even material success in life because the things that we do will be done graciously, charmingly, pleasantly, and uh, cheerfully. These values that come from Zen, in these people at least. Now other causes can produce them also, but there are very few places in the world where these principles have been so scientifically studied, so completely analyzed, and made so directly into an active philosophy of conduct. And for that reason, I think our study of this subject over the next four evenings will add something to this general picture. And now I think our time is pretty well up, so we'll let you go home now and work with the knickknacks for a while. <laughs>